ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Ms. Clerk, if you'd call the roll. Mayor or Mayor check Mayor? the roll. <laughs> yes. Phyllis Chris. Phyllis. Here. 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 Mike Lewis. Here. James Brown, David Moore, Ron French. Here. Bill Dunlap. Um, Bill Webb. Mr. Brown is here. I see that. And Tony Birch was absent. Holden Lill. Here. Okay. In the event of an emergency evacuation, an alarm will sound. Everyone should exit the building by way of the nearest stairwell in a safe and effective manner. If the nearest stairwell is blocked by smoke, use the other stairwell. Please do not use elevators. Once you've reached the main floor, follow the exit signs to exit the building. Quickly proceed away from the building. Please be mindful of others that are evacuating and of emergency vehicles. Does anyone wish to speak to items on the agenda? Seeing no hands, we'll go forward. Uh, need a motion to approve the April 15th minutes. Miss Crisp and a second by Mr. Lewis. Any deletions or alterations? Seeing none or hearing none, all those in favor of accepting say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. They are accepted. Now, discussion of our prescription drug plan. I'm going to recognize you initially Mr. Stallions, and let you lead from there, please, sir. If you'll just hit your button. Uh, actually, uh, Ms. King noticed a sharp increase uh, that we were on on the uh, on our drug plan spending. Uh, she got with Drew Mann and uh, tried to figure out what was going on and some things that we could do to help control costs. I've asked Drew to come if he would present some of his findings today and some of the recommendations to you all, Drew. Good afternoon. Um, I also have Jim Moore with me, who's a pharmacist from Humana. I am not clinical, so if you guys are going to start asking me, does that mean I have to, I'm not allowed to take my Nexium anymore. I'm going to refer that to a Mr. Moore. <laughs> and also um, Amy Sullivan from my office who helped with some of this data. L let me kind of give you a history lesson of what's going on, and I'm going to be brief. Um, when we moved from Keratin to Humana, we adopted some of Humana's pharmacy controls, and it caused some noise by the employee population. Um, we sort of went the other direction. We turned off many of those controls. So today, if, if an outsider looked at your plan, there are very few controls on your plan. What does that mean in layman's terms? That means if a physician writes one of your employees or their dependents a prescription, generally speaking, outside of a couple, they're going to be able to get it, no questions asked. Okay? There's no controls mechanisms at all. Now, I will say that is very different than what a lot of large employers are doing now and have recently moved to, and we're going to talk about some control measures today, but let me give you guys some numbers that will kind of put some, a little bit of fear in you to understand why we're sitting here today. And Jody and Don really are the ones that saw this, because the way the claims work, our office doesn't see the claims come out of your checking account until a month or so afterward, just the nature of the reporting. So they call and they say, holy moly, what happened? Well, my reaction is, I don't know what happened, but I will give me a day to dig into it. We had two members, and, and for the purpose of HIPAA as well as just trying to, to, it doesn't matter who they are. You guys don't care. We don't care. It is what it is. But you had two members uh, for the same condition taking a drug. One of the members' drugs cost $29,000 a month, and the other member is a $23,000 a month drug that's also paired with an $8,000 a month drug. Now this drug therapy is for a three to six month time, and it is for a condition that you hope will alleviate the need for a pretty large organ transplant, a liver transplant. So in one sense you go, holy moly, what in the world are we taking a $29,000 drug for for six months? Well. You know, if it's that or a $450,000 liver transplant and it works. And these new therapies, by the way, are working. And there is a tidal wave of specialty medications, or what these are called, coming down the pipe. They just are here. We've sort of known this day was coming, and we were sort of kind of buried our head in the sand a little bit. I'm not saying Blunt County. I'm saying the entire industry. So, for example, on TV at night, you see Humira. You see Embril. And Embril's a $1,500 or more a month therapy. 
And so what are employers doing to control some of these costs? Well, number one is making sure that the member truly needs that drug and that they've tried other therapies. And, and I will, I'm going to pick on the pharmaceutical companies for a minute. They are really good at marketing. And you're, you have members, Blunt, Knox, City of Knoxville, our largest employers we work with, all our employers, they're walking into the doctor's office and saying, hey, am I a candidate for Humira? Should I try that for my Crohn's? Or should I try that for my um, any of those um, uh, diseases like colitis, you know, those kinds of things, those immune, immuno, uh, what word am I looking for? Autoimmune, thank you. Yes, autoimmune drugs. And the thing is, the drug works. Many times you get somebody on a Humira, they may be on Humira theoretically for life, and that's a five dollars or $6,000 a month spend it can be. Okay, so it's just unbelievable. There's other drugs out there. Gleevec, I have clients on. So, so the point is, we need to have a strategy around what's going on with, with prescription drugs. And so what I wanted to do today was talk about some of those things that the committee should consider for a go-forward basis. There are two main types of controls. One of those is called prior authorization, and one of those is called step therapy. So let me describe prior authorization to you quickly. Prior authorization says, okay, Drew, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna write you a description for Humira. Okay, so I go to Blunt Discount, and I go get my Humira. Fill it, Blunt Discount pulls it up and it says, in the computer, now the member has gone to the pharmacy that day hoping to get their prescription that day. And Phil says, hey, this thing says it's prior authorization required. You need to call 1-800-HUMANA or Blue Cross. And, and, and everybody's dealing with this. It's not just the Humanas of the world. So I'm going to use Humana, but in a generic sense to tell you this is what's going on in the industry. So the member calls into 1-800-HUMANA. And they said, hey, you know, who's your physician that wrote the script? We need to reach out to the physician and make sure you meet this medical criteria. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that the doctor's not practicing good medicine or bad medicine. My job is not to indict him. But what I will tell you is my, my joke in our office is, is, you know, they're no generic drug reps. That drug rep in that doctor's office is selling brand name drugs. And I asked one of my friends one time, I said, he's a drug rep, and we were having dinner or something. I said, can you really influence the script writing habits of a physician? And he kind of looked at me like, are you crazy? Why do you think I have a job? And it dawned on me that the relationship that that rep has with that doctor really can influence the scripts that they write. I'll pick on Crestor for a minute. When Lipitor for, for cholesterol went generic, tons and tons of physicians switched their membership to Crestor. Well, why did they do that when Lipitor went generic? That's because there's a drug rep in their office every day talking about the value, the benefits, the greatness of Crestor. So, um, plus, you know, your doctor gives you samples. You think your doctor's great. Oh, he's awesome. He gave me samples. I'll get to that in a minute. So the, the, the prior authorization requires some involvement from the physician. Now, I will tell you, your plan is, is probably less than, there's 20% of the plans are less out there that don't have some of these prior authorizations required. Most of the times the physician writes this script or when Phil goes in to punch it in, now he knows your plan because he's so involved in Blount County. But if you went to... Walgreens in Knoxville, and you're dealing with a new person every time you walk in that place. You type in a Humira prescription for the first time, and it goes through day one, that pharmacy tech's going to be surprised. Does that make sense? They're used to seeing red light, no nope, prior authorization required. So the, the, the physician has to fill out that paperwork and then make the determination, and then Humana makes the determination whether that drug is covered or not covered based on medical need and medical necessity. That's prior authorization. The second piece is called step therapy. Step therapy says, here's my very short example. It's the only thing I can find that we buy in the US this way. I have high cholesterol. I walk into my doctor's office and he says, here, Drew, try these samples of Crestor. And I walk out thinking, my doctor's awesome. He gave me samples. He's great. Oh, by the way, that Crestor worked wonderful. Didn't have side effects, felt good. My cholesterol is going to come down. Doctor says, okay, well, I'll go ahead and write your prescription. I'll send it over at Blunt Discount, all right? Yep, okay, well, you can pick it up tomorrow or next day or whatever. Well, what you've done for your cholesterol is you have started at the very most expensive top of the food chain for that illness or condition that you have. Now, you haven't tried Lipitor generic that can be as much as 70 or 80% less because you started on those samples that your physician gave you. 
So one of the things step therapy says is, is we'll pay for Crestor, okay, and you, the Blount County plan, but before you can get there, we want you to step A, B, and C before we go to the latest and greatest, most expensive. Or sometimes it's not even a cost issue. Sometimes it's a Humana has enough data or Blue Cross has enough data to say drug A has better outcomes. We'll pay $10 more for a drug because we realize there's less side effects and better outcomes for that patient. So it's not always about cost, but I don't want to kid anybody. This is really a, a, a function of the expense side of it. Now, see, you think, well, why does Humana do that? You got to remember who, who Humana and Blue Cross are. They're these big insurance companies that they're on the risk for most of their business. Okay, you guys are self-insured, which means you get to take advantage of all the controls that they've built into their system, because their goal as an insurance company is to hold on to as much as their premium as they can while not irritating their membership. Is that, it's a fine balance. Does that make sense? So what we're doing is piggybacking on some of those. Uh, one of my clients, another large municipality here in East Tennessee, you know, they have adopted Humana standard controls as well as step therapy and prior off and a couple others. So what I want to open the committee's eyes to really is you guys are now at a crossroads where putting some of these controls and having your membership more involved in the drugs that they get is just going to be really important for you guys to manage this, you know, on a go forward basis. To give you an example of just how extreme May was, you know, normally we've been running a $330,000 to $350,000 a month for drugs. We had a $500,000, $100,000 month in May, one month. Now, that was a direct result of two members on this really extreme, very odd, unique situation. But there's more to come is the scary thing. And, 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 and Big Pharma, as you guys know, is in, the gov is in Washington's pocket, and they are pumping money in there. Um, they have, you can't out-legislate this because they're spending money like crazy. And so our plans are really having to be aggressive on what we're going to do. So what many of our plans are doing is, especially for a $29,000 drug, they're saying, you know, a 30%, a $60 copay on a $29,000 drug just doesn't, that's not, we can't do that. We have to have more skin in the game by you, the, the employee. So our plans are doing multiple things, and depending on what the committee would want us to do today, we can show you guys kind of what some of those plan options are. For specialty med, maybe you have a separate deductible for those, or a $100 copay for a specialty med. If someone's going to get a specialty med, they're going to pay a little bit more for that. Now, that copay applies to their out-of-pocket. So you're not going to take a single mom who's got MS and financially bankrupt her. I'm not saying that at all. But what you are going to say is, is they wouldn't necessarily be able to get that for that low $60 copay. And this is the same thing the state of Tennessee does, and I can, can go uh, give you guys many municipalities that are addressing this. The other thing, some plans are saying, you know what, for these specialty meds, we're just going to start treating it as we do major medical. And so I'll give you an example. That pill that that individual's taking to avoid having to have a liver transplant, well, had they had the liver transplant, they meet their deductible and coinsurance, just like everything else. Well, now, some reason beside, what's happened is the line is getting blurred between pharmacy and medical because now they can give you a pill to do the same thing they have to, used to have to do surgery for. Now they can give you a pill that is your uh, uh, cancer treatment versus having to go in and do radiology, Does that, or going in and, and radiate you. So what, but what's happening is people's plans haven't caught up to that. We're still charging people 60 bucks, and the drug's costing 3000 Not Is that going to change anybody's mind on getting a $3,000 drug? Probably not. But having a little more skin in the game would be prudent. The second thing is there's these things you guys may notice on television called patient assistant programs, where the big pharmacist, hey, if you have trouble paying, paying for your medicine, call AstraZeneca, and we'll take care of it for you. AstraZeneca, to be very clear, they're not interested in the 60 or 150 bucks from your employee. They're interested in the $28,000 from the health fund. That's where the money is. If the, I mean, <laughs> it's a pretty good investment. So let me get this straight. I'm going to give you 500 bucks to help you pay for a drug that I'm getting ready to make $28,000, so net profit of pharma is 50%. I mean, that's, a, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll give you 500 bucks to help you pay your drugs. My instinct is today, the way your plan's set up for $60 copayment, your employees aren't even bothering calling to get help to pay for their drugs. Does that make sense? I mean, it's, 
I'm not going to go through the pain in the rear end. Now, some of them may be doing. I'm not saying $60 is not a lot of money, but many of our plans, like I will say Humana on a fully insured basis, what they do is they have a separate $2,500 sort of cost share for specialty drugs, and once you hit that $2,500 over the course of the year, you're done. So there are a lot of opportunities here for the county. One of the things you guys say, well, Drew, what's this going to save us? You're talking between two and three hundred thousand dollars of potential savings, but what I'm going to sit here and tell you is, this is not. I, I wouldn't necessarily investigate this for the two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars of savings. This is really more to protect the plan on a go-forward basis. Is really what we're talking about today. Um, the other thing, which is unique, you're talking about one percent of your population that's going to be affected by this. There, we're not talking about a lot of employees. You with me? It's just so expensive that you have two people on that one drug. I mean, those people are spending almost $60,000 a month. So we are talking about a very low membership impact. But I don't want to sit here and lead the committee down the road, though, this is no big deal, put it in, it's easy. The first year, there's some pushback and there's some noise. And uh, it's important that you guys understand that. But, but you are actually in the minority today because other plans are adopting these controls and have had them. And we tried it five years ago, but at the time the climate was different and, and leadership at the time said, hey, turn those things off. I'm tired of getting phone calls. So, Any questions that I can answer for you guys? I tried to hit it at a high level. I'll be happy. Or if there's clinical information, Jim would be happy to go through that as well. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would please, if you will simply hit the button in front of you, it's turned on to where when you hit your button, it will immediately turn your microphone on. If you would please just hit it and I'll try to recognize you as you hit your buttons. Ms. Birchfield. On the specialty meds, are we talk, is it the price that's going to put them there? How are you going to decide what becomes the specialty? Yeah, there's actually an identifier. Th th there is an identifier of whether a drug is specialty or not. And we would, because Humana is paying our pharmacy claims for us, we adopt Humana's what is their specialty list. So we, we take their brain power of what they have determined to be specialty. Now, is, does cost determine specialty? Not 100% of the time, but let me say this, most of the specialty drugs are very expensive. But there are very expensive drugs that are not on the specialty list also. Jim, can you think of a drug that's, um, that's, not, that's expensive that may not be on the specialty list? Yeah, individual, provisional. And what, what are those for treatment of? Usually there's, there's stimulants. Okay. Or, um, oh, that's right. There's a drug out there that's being over uh, prescribed right now for folks that are shift workers that want to be able to work late. And um, it's really designed for narcolepsy. But what happens is if you're a shift worker, you can get that pro vigil or new vigil, and it's quite expensive. Is it a, roughly like $1,000 a month? At least 1000 Yeah. So that's a drug that is very unique. It's for narcolepsy. It's being used for something else. Now, I will say this. If we adopt these controls, that new vigil or pro vigil would either end up in the step therapy or the prior authorization category. Does that make sense? Yes. Did I answer your question? Yes. No, no. Okay. Yeah, gave us the high price. On the specialty list, how much more of a percentage do we go up? Okay, let, let me, I, and I may have said a couple numbers wrong. I'm, I'm going to restate these numbers because I think we're on the same page, okay? okay? The member impact of adding prior authorization to all current specialty drugs, we went back and pulled everybody who's on a specialty drug today, would be 36 members. That's 1% roughly of, of the, I mean, it's a small number, okay? The second number that I didn't say that I needed to say. If we put in Humana's step therapy um, and prior authorizations, that's 13.5% or 479 members, okay? So specialty is different than the prior auth and step therapy that I talked about. Specialty is sort of its own little world. And we would adopt Humana's specialty list. And I will say this Humana specialty list is different than Aetna's, is different than United Healthcare's, is different than Cigna's, is different from Blue Cross's. So let me rephrase and make sure okay. I've got it. There are 479 of our employees that would qualify 
or taking medicine that are on the specialty list, or am I just totally here? No, wrong? I, I said it. No, let me let's be real clear. Okay. Thirty-six are on specialty. Okay. Okay. The 479 is those folks, when I use the example of you needed to use step therapy, okay, okay you started you. at Crestor instead of starting at the most expensive. And we, and we have the opportunity, and this is going to be working with the committee and working with Humana, of, of grandfathering certain folks who are on a drug. I, I, my personal example is we, we have 12 employees at Trinity, and we move insurance quite a bit because if it's cheaper, we just it's a commodity. You know, we're insured. You just buy it. And, Tell everybody. And I get new cards every two years. My wife gets mad at me, and she has a pretty serious condition. I know what it's like to go home and tell your spouse, hey, you can't take this medicine you've taken for 10 years. And we had that exact thing happen in our house. She was on A. The carrier said, we don't pay for A. We only pay for B. Her doctor wouldn't fill the paperwork out. Because I will tell you, the physicians are getting worn out with this. And the, it, part of it, I blame her doctor. There's multiple. But now she's on A now, and it worked out fine. But I had to have some, it was not fun coming home and telling your bride to change meds. So I, I truly understand how personal this is for folks. So there's different options the committee has in terms of uh, grandfathering or those kinds of things. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Awesome. Mr. French. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Drew, uh, I'm assuming, and I don't like to use that word, but uh, step therapy, therapy is not just resigned to drug versus drug, but it's also the the strength of the the uh, the dosage, the strength. In other words, and I I'm just basing it on sure. on some some of the things where one of the drugs that I take is you know we started out at a certain strength and then we moved up and then we moved on up again. Yep. Which uh, we finally got the right dosage. Which, right. Would step therapy. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the pharmacist on that one because I do okay. not know. Jim, do you know the answer to that one? Yeah, please do, if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, probably you're talking about quantity limits. So if, it's, if you're on a certain drug that's a certain strength and you may need more of it than you would for a, a, a different dose, a different milligram, so you may need to go through that. You guys have our standard quantity limits in place. Step therapy wouldn't be impacted by that. Step therapy is for that drug independent, not, not based on the milligram strength. Well, so it's, it's not based on no. milligram based on the drug itself. Just the dr okay. There could be a handful of exceptions to that process, but typically if, if it's Lipitor as an example, we require step therapy on Lipitor, saying that you have to try the generic Lipitor first. It doesn't matter if you're on 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams. So it's usually based on drug. There could be a few exceptions, but most of the time it's based on the drug name itself. Okay. But Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Lale. Thank you. Um, when you're talking about the step therapy, uh, most doctors, would, would they have access to your step list so that when, when they, you walked in there and they prescribed something to you, uh, you know, there is a, a published list or not a published but a, a list that they are uh, have access to to know yeah. that in, in rather defense, than yeah. giving you the crest or they should start here yeah I, I will in defense of the doctors there's too many plans out there for them to keep up with there okay. I mean personally I struggle trying to remember which carrier to, and I do this all day every day so from a physician standpoint they really typically don't know who that list is typically this happens at the point of sale meaning at the pharmacy okay so when you live this out if you're a if you're a sheriff deputy okay and you he's doc said you're gonna go on crest or you go to Phil and one of the things we would do is communicate what you you have an advantage so much of your spend gets filled at blunt discount we can really educate those guys over there that's a good thing and so when they run it through Crestor may not go run it through but he knows that if he runs Lipitor generic through it's going to go through does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And if I say anything wrong, yeah, okay. Um, so typically the doctor sometimes gets taken out. It's, it's a little bit odd. It's, and this happens every day. The pharmacist calls over to ETMG and says, hey, Crestor didn't go through. I'm going to switch this to Lipitor because it'll go through. They run what's called a test claim. They test to see if Lipitor, and the doctor says, yeah, that's fine. Start them on that if that works. If not, or the doctor may say, no way. He has to have Crestor because he's on X, Y, and Z. 
And that's when you go through the process with Humana of getting that approval. Okay. So, yeah, because I, I've actually sort of experienced part of that in a process, and, and it ended up with two or three trips to the doctor and uh, a couple of things like that where you go in and say, well, look, these guys, they don't, you know, my insurance will not do this. What else is it? And then you go back, and, and then they go and research what goes with what yep. kind of deal like you just described. So, but the culmination, or, or rather where the flag goes up, is at the point of sale is what you're saying. It, it is. And, and, and the thing is, you have to understand, there's something called the white coat phenomenon, the lab coat phenomenon. Whatever a doctor says is gospel. And that's what your, your member hears. So then they go to the pharmacy, and the pharmacist says, well, my doctor, what my doctor prescribed to me isn't going to be, isn't cover, you know, isn't what they're going to pay. So here's the thing I would tell you. The pharmacist is is dealing with this all day, every day. The doctor's dealing with this already all day, every day. My physician friends, if you get them alone, one of the things they complain mostly about now is, is they have to have staff that basically all they do is help folks get their scripts now because every other employer is battling this. I mean, big pharma is marketing so well. We used to brag about hitting 60 and 70% generic penetration rates. Well, we're, you know, we're at 88, 85. But so what? I mean, our claims are going up. It's not the generic. It's that small percentage of brands that are what's costing us all the money. And it's only going to get worse. I, you know, if you guys could put a wall around it and knew you were only going to spend $350,000 a month, I think the committee would say, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. But the problem is it's not going to be three fifty dollars a month. You know, you're going to be looking at four fifty, dollars And then, you know, a couple years down the road, we're going to be at six hundred. Okay. How do we get there? So what I'm hearing you saying, if we're at 80% generic, that part of the plan is, is being handled probably about as good as it can be. Absolutely. So, so I, I'm interpreting from what you're saying that we need to develop a separate protocol, so to speak, for those specialty drugs. Because uh, what is being done now is in pretty good shape. Yeah, and and I would, can't really get much more efficient in I, a way. I would add one thing to that, Mr. Lale, is that you need to uh, also some of the higher cost brand name that don't necessarily fall in the specialty tier. Mm -hmm. And we picked on Crestor a lot today. It's just an easy target. And, and so making sure that our membership starts off with Lipitor generic and works their way up rather than what we're doing today is starting at the top. And if Crestor doesn't work, then we're working our way down. And the reason why that is is because Big Pharma is marketing to the doctor, marketing to your member. And they're good at it. I mean, they spend more money than Coke and Pepsi do. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Lewis. Drew, on the, I guess there's some bright spot in that if you, if you start looking at things like Nexium that are now going to start to be over the counter. And so that cost would actually, I guess, for us go down. And I don't know how many folks we have on that, but. Good news is a, a lot less than we did five years ago, but. So, yeah. Especially now. So, on the prior authorization of step therapy, is it one? Of, it, you're saying it's one of the other. No, it, those are a la carte. So you can buy. I have clients who have step therapy, have clients who have prior auth. They have their standard prior auth step therapy language. There may be a drug that we determine. You got to be careful when you start going line by line, drug by drug, because the drug, you know, the drug phone book is gigantic. But there are certain things that we may determine that that in this population that you have that we don't want to do a step therapy on Crestor. Okay. We want to just leave that one alone. So, but my recommendation would be that really, I mean, we've hired Humana, they're doing a good job is to adopt their standard language, maybe a couple offsets here and there, but, but I'm not clinical. And so I have to trust the folks that are clinical. Um, now I can, you know, there's, and you don't want to tell the doctors how to prescribe medicine, you know, to do medicine. That's not the job. We just want there to be more controls in the cost of the plan. So you can you can do prior authorization and step therapy in the same. Absolutely, most people do. Yes, okay. sir. That which was my other question. What what is the majority of companies, larger companies out there like us? What what's the current? Jim, we talked the other day. Wouldn't you say probably less than twenty percent of the companies don't have these controls? Yeah. Yeah. So eighty percent have these controls. So when I mentioned that you're in the minority, that was what I was referencing. Okay. Thank you. 
looking around, I see a clear board, so I will sort of consult with you, Mr. Mann, when I get your attention back, Sorry. and with Mr. Staggins, in line with the fact that we do not have before us tonight Humana's protocol, I will ask you to please get a copy of that protocol, forward it to Mr. Stallions and Ms. King, and when it is received, if it's all right with this body, I will schedule another meeting for us to deal with this because the numbers that you have quoted, this isn't something that we can let rock on for several months. Is that agreeable by unanimous consent with this body? I see every head shaking. If there is a no, please tell me no. I hear no no's, Mr. Mann. Is that all right? With yes, you? sir. Uh, would, I have time out. Yes, uh, sir. Would that, uh, when we get to that point, would there be uh, some kind of a recommendation, or are we just going to study the protocol? No, sir. There will have to be a recommendation go forward well, because that's, that will be a change in exactly. Our that's what I, that was the point. Well, that's obvious. We can't do that tonight. We have nothing for us, Mr. Exactly. Lell. That's why I made that request. And like I say, with unanimous consent. We don't have a motion, we don't have anything to act on, and I'll just make that request when it's forwarded, we'll schedule another meeting go from there. Is that good with this body? I don't see a head shaking no, and I don't see a light turned on except Mr. Lewis. Just one question, Don, when you get that, if you could, could you go ahead and forward that out to this committee to this before body. we meet? Yes. Thank you. Is that painless enough for you, sir? We've actually uh, probably 95% of the way there, so we've done most of this work and we'll get it out. My, my goal tonight was really to sort of open the committee's eyes of the, what's going on, and really Jody and Don were the ones that unfortunately discovered this. You stood there too long, Mr. Dunlap. <laughs> he got me. Got you. Is there any way that this could be sent out to Jody and them and then we schedule a meeting for August? Is that that's, doable? I, that's I, up. I, if, as soon as we get it, I'll schedule a meeting. Yeah. We're, we're, we're at y'all's back and call, so you tell us what you need. Yeah. The, the one little hiccup in this is a timing issue. Every year, the insurance companies redo their formulary list. It's the list of drugs that they approve and don't approve, and that changes every year. They all do this, Humana, all of them. The 2015 list is getting ready to come out, so just one thing I mentioned to the committee. We're probably six weeks away from that being done. Okay, but but I will bring you the recommendation. I'll bring you the impact. I'll bring you those things. But just understand that a few of those drugs can end up moving from column A to B based on the new list. Okay. Thank you, sir. We'll move forward. There isn't any action actually be taken other than the request request that's been put forward. Mr. Stan, move on to item four. I think as everybody knows, we've been uh, for quite some time, and a lot of work has gone into uh, finding a payroll and HR system for the county. Uh, what we're on now dates back to 1985. Uh, Bill Ronner with the Sheriff's Department has been kind enough to kind of head that project up. Uh, Bill is here tonight to give this committee just a brief overview. I know some of y'all, like probably all of y'all have seen the presentation, but we would like to get that in front of this committee. And if it's okay with the chairman, I'd like Bill to come up and just uh, give a quite quick rundown and see if the committee has any questions. Thank you, sir, if you will approach. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, Mr. Chairman and commissioners um, and other members of the committee. I think you've all had an opportunity to see the presentation, so it's not my intent to go through that again, but I did want to make myself available if you have any questions about the project. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Birchfield. The company or the companies that you've looked at, and the one in particular, I can't remember the name, okay. are there any local jobs that are going to come from this, or is it all outsourced? Uh, let me make sure I understand your question. Are you asking whether this project will generate additional jobs? In this community. In the community? No, I don't foresee that at all. Anyone else? Mr. Lyle. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of things. I, I've heard the presentations and I'm aware of the concept and, and uh, really share the enthusiasm a lot of people have said about it because I see some potentially good possibilities that could come out of a program like this. If you could share with me how exactly the data is going to be collected. I'm talking about what kind of, of apparatus is going to be utilized to uh, collect the time, uh, do whatever. We, as I've been thinking and doing some checking around on this, this process, if you sit down and look at the hundreds of different job descriptions we've got in this county, I mean, and then you add to that their different payroll requirements, that being the insurance deductions, the uh, all the different possibilities. I mean, we come up with thousands of variations, you know, and, and one employee could have as many as 15 or 20 variations. It's going to be worse than that last election where you had, couldn't figure out if you voted in the city, out of the city, whatever, whatever. That thing was crazy, and, and that was just six, I think, was the max. So share with me how you're going to collect that. Okay. Uh, and, and I may have another specific question or two after this. but sure. I, want, yeah. I want you to think of the data that is relevant to this discussion okay. in four categories. One is the employee-specific data that's all of your employee data that's, that's pertinent to you, your job, your location, your salary, your pay, your work rules. So that, that's about you. The other chunk of the data is the work rules and the pay rules that affect you. In other words, you work, you're salaried, exempt, you're expected to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week, there is no overtime, there is no comp time, or you're non-exempt hourly, um, you're scheduled to work 40 hours a week. You're allowed to work 10 hours overtime with prior authorization from your supervisor, for example. So you've got employee-specific data. You've got your work rules. You've got your pay rules. Um, and then you've got the timekeeping part of this data. And I think that's really part mm -hmm. of what your question was. Let me back my way into the answer. Most of the employees will not be asked or expected to enter their time or their the time not worked, any exceptions to their work schedule on any kind of a daily or weekly or monthly basis. They will enter their schedule or their supervisor will enter their schedule and the system will operate on a default basis. They will get paid according to the schedule that's been entered into the system unless some exception has been entered. In other words, I call in sick and so I get a day of sick pay instead of a day of regular pay. That will affect the majority of the employees. Hourly employees and certain other employees will be expected to clock in, so to speak, using one of several devices. And that can be a smartphone, that can be a device, a card reader that they swipe, that can be a fingerprint reader, that can be a laptop or a tablet. Have I left anything out? About five or six different devices that we have costed and estimated based on the population of employees, whether it's a school bus driver or a school teacher or a sheriff's deputy. We have estimated the numbers and types of devices and Kronos gave us their cost estimate for those devices. So employees, certain employees will be expected to clock in uh, in a different fashion than they do now. But the, the time will be captured by those devices and transmitted electronically through the internet or through your smartphone, you know, and a Wi-Fi connection to the system and entered into the system as if you had punched a time clock, clock automatically. So it's captured in that way. So you've got a group of, most of the employees will be on a default basis. They will not be expected to clock in, so to speak, or enter their time unless there's an exception to their work schedule. Other employees will be expected to enter their time and capture it on a daily basis. And that's what drives the pay process for them. Okay, uh, I understand the first part of that with, uh, because there's certain basic uh, individual data that has to be collected on that person so that they're identified and, and all of the parameters of their pay is locked into that one system. Uh, the part that 
kind of disturbs me at this point is it, it seems like you're only really checking on, to use a, one of a better term, hourly people. If you, if you do the other stuff, that's the same kind of operating system we're doing now. Well, and, and that's a good Except point. we're doing it by paper and, yes. and not that's, by That's a good point. On a work group basis, the supervisor could actually insist that every employee clock in. If you've uh -huh. got a, a highly compensated salaried exempt employee, they might get a little bit annoyed at being asked to clock in like an hourly employee might be asked to do. Yeah. But you can set the system up to do that. It's very flexible in terms of what you ask versus what it will do okay. automatically. And then, and then you take that and complicate it because you've got some employees that will report to a different work site two out of three days, three out of four days, yes, sir. four out of five days, you know, they will begin their day at a different spot. So is that? Well, and they don't have to clock in at, at the, in the morning necessarily. They can clock in later on. But somebody okay. has to approve that. Okay, so. So those are the work rules and payrolls. So under the work rules, the department, the individual departments who establish the work rules will have to develop a policy on that and that will define and determine exemptions, uh, that will define and determine, uh, again, for one of a better word, classified hourly, whatever, well, on that. And that will, ha where would, who, who manages that data? Some of, the, some of that's already defined by employee handbooks, uh, departmental rules, uh, policies and procedures that are already in place. But I certainly do anticipate that we'll have to develop some new policies and procedures to cover some of this stuff that we don't know exactly at this moment how it will work. Well, I'd gone to talk to Troy today, and he, I'm not going to say that. Anyway, because you, when you deal with the education system, which is 1,400 and some employees, you've got not only that, but you've got the complications of contract rules. You've got... Uh, a whole new set of, of possibilities and variances that could come out of that, and are, and are you? And I'm asking you: Are you confident that this system can handle that kind of variation? Should the let's say the school board fully endorse this and say we're going to have a system by which we're checking on each of our each of our employees every day, whether they have no exempt employees, et cetera, or down to we're only going to check on hourly, whatever they decide their parameters are. And by the way, it's my understanding each department will be able to determine that policy individually, correct? I think so. Okay. Yeah. And the, the system, let me assure you, I have complete confidence the system can handle whatever we ask okay. for it to but, do. And then I guess maybe I should ask someone else, maybe Randy, if that happens, and let's say Bill has a different idea of what he wants from it, or Jimbo does, or, or, or the Troy and the school board, or they have different ideas from that. How will that, will that impact uh, payroll? I mean, because ultimately, it's kind of like once you establish this, if payroll does it, everybody's going to have to do pretty close to that, in, that, you know, what they say on that, right? or else it's going to be a jumbled mess. There, I anticipate several things. One is that the system can handle anything we ask it okay. to do. I anticipate the development of new policies and procedures through the implementation process as these issues bubble up and become visible to us. I, I do anticipate that there will be changes in the way people behave and the way people capture their time. I do anticipate there will be some people who will be annoyed by the new changes and the process changes. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. And I anticipate that it will bring visibility to practices that were not visible before, additional management oversight and control capabilities. Oh. The system has the flexibility you're looking for. Yeah, and, and I see those possibilities that you just described yes, there because, you know, good accounting makes good accountability, in my opinion, and, and this, this process could be very beneficial along that line. I'm just concerned that there are so many different aspects to, to different departments that it would become maybe extremely difficult for those departments? I mean... Well, that's, that's part of the implementation process is to 
on a department by department basis identify document and load the business rules that drive the, that department's behaviors and operations so the system is flexible enough to handle all those different business rules and pay rules so that the school's operations are not disrupted the sheriff's operations right, are not disrupted right. um, I think there's certainly value in streamlining and making certain processes common across the system. There we go. To the extent you can without disrupting operations by forcing the same process on everybody. Because what works for the sheriff's office is not going to work for a school bus driver. Oh, no. No. There's so. totally different job descriptions right. and responsibilities and so forth. And it, it's been my, and I'll use Ron's word, assumption from what we've heard that, that most of the departments are on board with this okay I think that's fair uh, I'm sorry I think that's a fair statement okay but when I get ready to vote on that thing you know uh, I would feel more comfortable and, and I'm not looking in an anti mode at all please None. don't misunderstand that I would be more comfortable if I had something where the school board said okay this is the policy that we're going to develop so that Troy can have this or whatever There'd be a definitive, uh, of course, the sheriff's sitting here, he can nod his head or do whatever at this point, but, you know, members of the school board are not here. Uh, and I'd like to see the departments in some way indicate to us that, because that's a lot of money we're getting ready to expend. And, I, and, and if it's, the process I think is worth it, but I'd just like to see that, you know, they step up and say, and, I, and I've talked, to Don just, you know, and he, you know, Don's excited about it and so forth, but still every department, I would like to see them in some way make a definitive statement to the commission and more than likely as this thing comes up for a vote, that would increase the chances of it become, you know, adopted. So. Well, I can't speak for the school board, but the departments yeah. that are well, impacted see, by this have been <clears throat> part of the process. So. Well, see, that's me. I can't speak for any of them. Yes, sir. And, and and we, you know, and I, but I, I'm sort of, and Ron can neither nod or shake his head on this and Mike, but, uh, and Gary, if he cared to, but, you know, it makes it a lot easier when it comes before the full commission for an expenditure of funds that we feel like that the people, and Tanya, I'm sorry, uh, that, okay, this is what it is and this is what we really want, you know, uh, and that way we feel comfortable and confident in going ahead with it. So, and I'll hush. Thank I, you. For I appreciate your... the suggestion. I'll talk to Mr. Vineyard okay. about that when we get through. Great. Thank you, Ms. Chris. I had went down um, as several other, I think, office holders and department heads and listened to the different companies um, um, give their qualifications. And um, some of the big questions were, how about the sheriff's office? How about fire departments? Because fire is considered even different than what the sheriff's office is. Um, not all of the companies could, could handle that. They hadn't, um, didn't have that software, couldn't, couldn't manage that. Kronos has several businesses that they already have in place that they are handling um, situations like the sheriff's office and um, fire departments and things like that that are set out there that is a, a lot different than what my department would be. Oh, yeah. And comment, Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll yield to Commissioner. Yeah. Well. <laughs> well. Well, there's I really just wanted to say that I, I understand what you're saying, and, and the point is, is that we are looking at such a diversity across the board and, and to pull all this together and make it effective and do what we're talking about it doing, we're gonna have to have those uh, items in place. <clears throat> and, and it was gonna lead to a question is, how long do you anticipate the basic data gathering and so forth to bring this up to speed where you can flip the switch and go to work with it? And At a minimum, nine months. I that's, think you'd be doing great to get so all nine that months, done. Nine month implementation. Yes, sir. Sure. Didn't see you. I was looking at <laughs> no. Phyllis is much better well, looking at you. <laughs> sure. I appreciate the questions you asked because that was Eric 
My concern also, because the deputies do, you might get called out in the middle of the night, might have to stay over to work a wreck, and things of that nature. But Bill and his team has done an excellent job on this and answering those questions and addressing each office that I know of about the unique things that might happen. So thank you for that. Uh, the mayor, correct me if I'm wrong, we had an office holders meeting and the office holders uh, all agreed that this was the best route for uh, to fix a, a problem, a future potential disaster and a cost savings at the same time. So uh, I'm not speaking for the office holders, I'm speaking for myself, but we were at a meeting and, uh, and you made some good points that we were concerned with, but they addressed those points. Mr. Dunlap. I feel strongly this is like Jimbo, that this is gonna be a benefit to the county. A uh, couple of things I wanna make sure that's gonna be positive for the highway department. Uh, we were told several years ago, the Department of Labor, that we had to work eight hours, 10 hours. We can't bring our people in to clock out for lunch. Is that gonna be a problem in this program? Clocking out for lunch? No, we we're working eight to 10. Uh, is that gonna show overtime? Uh, yes, it, 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 will. it will. You'll be able to write the business rules and, and load employee schedules in such a fashion so that an employee who's scheduled to work eight hours a day will only be allowed to work eight hours a day unless their supervisor goes in and authorizes overtime. Okay. You can set um, windows of opportunity so that employees cannot clock in too late, I mean too early, and generate uh, unauthorized overtime. For example, if somebody wanted to clock in at 7.30, you can set it so that they cannot clock in, so to speak, until 10 to eight. Um, and you can limit the number of hours they're going to get paid and it will flag the supervisor that if somebody actually worked overtime, the supervisor will get an alert to let them know that so they can manage that more tightly. What we've got going right now is we've got a 10 minute break. Yeah, if they clock in, say at 20 after, 19 after, something like that, it's going to drop them to the 7.30, 6.30. If they drop in at 15 after, clock in at 15 after, it's going to kick them back up. So it does not allow them now to clock in before that 20 minute breakover where it kicks them down to 6.30. And I believe the system has the flexibility okay. to write those rules. Okay. There's a word for it that's escaping me, Ginger and Susan, but it's, I'm calling it little windows of opportunity or okay. windows of denial. There's another phrase for it that's more descriptive. But. Okay, we're, we're different on pay schedule than what the rest of the departments are. We're bi-weekly. Yes. Uh, everybody else I believe is first and 15th and 30th, something like that. Will we still be able to stay that way? Yes. It's okay. It handles monthly, okay. weekly, bi-weekly, bi-monthly, once, once every six months, whenever it'll, it will do it. This is their core business. They specialize in municipal and governmental okay. as long clients. As we don't have to change, you know, because we, we, years ago we went through this and it was a total hassle to try and change your bill schedules. So we've been bi-weekly ever since I've been here in 1980. So. Yes, it needs to stay that way. Uh, we talked about quite a bit of the payroll system, but it's showing down here payroll and HR system. What's what is the HR in this? What are we looking at on that? Um, all of the all of the functions and the tasks that are associated with an employee or an applicant from the moment they apply for a job, all the way through the interview and screening process all the way through the onboarding process that Jody does get them set up as a new employee in payroll and benefits enrollment, uh, all the way through their work and getting them paid their retirement. That's the human resources spectrum. Okay. All of the tasks that are associated with every one of those steps are manual tasks now performed manually by human beings. The system will capture that data from the earliest moment and keep it with an employee all the way through. And it automates a lot of that. It automates open enrollment. It has an employee self-service portal so that it, every employee will be able to log into the system, change a beneficiary designation on life insurance, add a dependent if they have a child, take a dependent away if they get divorced, um, pick their health enrollment options, pick their uh, life insurance options. All of that's automated and takes away a lot of the manual aspect of it. Most of the savings are on the payroll process side, uh, but what this should help you avoid doing is having to hire anybody else in the benefits area to help Jody do all of this, and it will help you avoid outsourcing the open enrollment function. Okay, 
And then I guess my next question is, is this going to affect any of the employees in the HR department right now? I don't think so. Okay. But there are but three or four of you. <laughs> Yes, sir. No, I don't, I don't foresee any, any decrease in employment in that group. Yes, sir. Mr. Lewis. Uh, one question, Bill, and I, and I guess I'm, I'm just understanding on the front end loading of, of the implementation process. On the scheduling, whether it's salary or salary exempt, non-exempt, uh, is there a a system of checks and balances in there to make sure that as we put all this into the system that we're not violating any Fair Labor Standard Act things. How, how do we know that when we put that in, what we're putting in is information uh, or a system that doesn't violate any of those standards? I'm confident the system has that capability, but I'd like to double check with David Herndon, the account executive for Kronos on that particular question. It, I mean, it, it, that system, it seems like, will only be as good as we make it as we get the information in it right. from the very beginning. So that, to me, is the caution period to make sure that as we put that or enter that information in and how we pay our folks and how they clock in yes, and sir. all that is done correctly on the front end and we got help to do that to make sure we don't make any errors as we go in. Well, and that, that is part of Kronos' job as part of the consulting and implementation services. And, and part of their job is, is the hosting fee and the annual maintenance fee is updating their system, their software, to keep abreast of legislative and regulatory changes like FLSA. So I'm, I'm really confident in saying that, let's just say there was an FLSA rule that said a person in this job category cannot, under any circumstances, work more than 56 hours a week, that their system would flag that. But I would like to ask David Herndon that question. And then we have those override capabilities as yeah. are allowed. And then the other thing is, you talked about the devices and so forth that we have to get people to check in or to you know, monitor how, right. you know, as people come in and out and lunches, as, as Bill was saying. If, is part of the contract with Kronos, because obviously those, any of those devices don't last forever. Do we have a, do you know what the turnover rate on those, th you know, whether it's smartphone, whether it's a laptop, whether it's a fingerprint or whatever, as we have to replace those, is that a part of the annual fee that we pay or do we have to buy those things outside of the contract? Some of those we can buy outside of the contract that we would not be furnished by Kronos. Some of the devices would be furnished by Kronos and they have warranty on them. Uh, I don't know what the warranty is. I'm assuming it's a year. Um, but I can ask David that question as well. Because part of our ongoing costs will be also the replacement of those yes. devices. So we ought to, it'd be good to kind of know what that I figure might be as well. We'll check on that as well. Thank you. Mr. French. Bill, I, I just like to say I appreciate the committee's uh, work, the research they've done. and. Because I read over this RFP and I read over the bids I, two or three times and trying to get it right in my mind. And uh, most, uh, I think everybody on the committee I, I'm personally uh, acquainted with and I trust those people. I just met you the other day, but I've been impressed with your presentation and your answers to the questions. However, I, I do have a, a, a couple of questions. One, I assume our IT department couldn't handle this this process. And and two, the second question is, did the committee look at a possibility, and I'll maybe answer this question at the end of my question. Uh, did the committee look at the possibility of, of maybe having Cronus or one of the one of these uh, bidders do a partial uh, process in our IT department. Maybe we could save money by having the IT department do a part of it. Did they look at that or is it a case of uh, too many cooks spoil the broth, you know? No, I'm, I'm starting from the proposition that our IT department could do this if asked to do it. And that was one of the options that Kronos and some of the other vendors presented. 
at a high level, the options come down to two choices. Their system, their computers, servers, hardware, um, their support, their security, their failover and redundancy capability with servers in different locations in case one fails. So that's the cloud model that we're advocating. The other alternative is basically we buy license to, licenses for their software, which is part of the first option, and we run the software on our computers and our servers, which means that we are responsible for buying and maintaining those servers. We're responsible for server security. We're responsible for redundancy and failover capability in case one of those servers fail. Uh, the difference is that it keeps the IT department from coming to you on a repetitive basis asking for a new server or asking for more staff to run this system. This is, um, this is Kronos' core competency and we're more comfortable, frankly, with, and this is no reflection on the IT department, it's just this is their core competency. We think this is a good business model is to host it on their system. That way, if anything goes wrong, we know exactly where to go. Okay, any other statements or questions? It's just, just one. Uh, Mr. Holden asked for confirmation from the office holders, what I've heard and what I've seen during these uh, explanations and all this you've given us. Uh, the Highway Department is in support of this. Thank you. Throw us in the group hold. Yeah. Uh, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, the confirmation, that's, that's fine. I think uh, that probably other members of the commission need to hear that also, Bill. And uh, like I said, it, uh, the current commission pretty much likes to go along with things that are good for the future, that, you know, within what reason that they can. Uh, uh, this is something that's within a doable range, and I think it just, you know, they just need to understand that uh, this is something that the departments are, are informed of, have explored, and have made, found it to be uh, within their parameters to do, because, you know, each one of them have a different set of, uh, you know, uh, finances, et cetera, and so forth, and, and, and needs of their personnel that needs to go in there. And it's gonna take a complete unification of effort among all the people to get all that basic data loaded because that's that's not a small it is not. task at all with, with given the variances and that's what has concerned me the most is that will those all be collected because uh, I know what it was when when I had my own school if I looked out just across my staff if there were 20 people on that staff there were 20 entirely different sets of variances that had to be accounted for and then you multiply that across the entire county employees it's no wonder Jody growls at me every once in a while when I come by that's why the implementation is expected to take nine months instead exactly. of nine days yeah <laughs> well, I started to say if you promised anything less than that I think you were really flim flamming because that well, that's 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 actually pretty ambitious but that's our objective yeah because you got that's a lot of data entry it right is. there it, it is. sure is Mr. Lewis. I yeah, just deal with, with all that in mind. Just wanted to thank you for quite for volunteering your time and effort thank and thank the committee for all the work they've done and, and the office holders for all the time they put in as well. Yeah, I appreciate that and the members of the team appreciate that because I certainly did not do this by myself. I'm the one standing up here fielding the questions, but the team is the one that really has done the work and I appreciate their help. Mr. Dunlap. One more comment, Mr. Chairman, I'll shut up, but uh, a lot of us in here remember the old office holders that was here years ago. It was my department, my office. Don't mess with me. Don't, don't come over here and ask me anything. The group that I'm seeing here, and I'm going to throw commission into this too, we want things better when we leave than what we started with. And I, I admire these office holders. I admire these commissioners for taking that stand and making things better. I see no other lights, so I'll make my comment now. I'll put in layman's terms what Mr. Lale is actually beating around the bush to say is it would be well appreciated by the county commission if the department heads showed their support for it when it comes before them to be voted on. Message received. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Ronner. Thank you. I see no other lights.
I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> before we leave this, uh, you know, I, we've heard the, uh, the presentation by Bill, and uh, we've heard the long version and tonight the short version. I, I just thought it would be a great uh, uh, gesture on our part if this left the HR committee with a recommendation. What? Uh, I mean, it came out of the budget committee with a recommendation to the commission. It's now been presented to the HR committee. Is that something we would like to do, is come out to, and, and send that back to the commission with a recommendation, approval or a recommendation from and, the HR committee? You know, we can stand for a motion. We really don't have it in front of us to actually vote on anything, but if you want to make a motion that the HR committee endorses movement but however you want to word it mr Bayer. if you'll make the motion i'm sure you're going to get a second and we'll try to get it written down properly thank you mr chair i'd like to make a motion that we uh send this back to the com the full commission with uh, an endorsement from the hr committee do i have a second okay i have a second from the sheriff do i have any questions comments Seeing none, since this is going to go to the full commission, would you please do a roll call? Mayor Mitchell? Yes. Phyllis Chris? Carrie Farmer? Yes. Mike Lewis? Yes. James Braun? Yes. Ron French? Aye. Bill Dunlap? Yes. Tanya Birchfield? Yes. Holden Lell? And this will be forwarded as information, if that's all right with the members of this committee. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much Mr. Honor. Uh, seeing nothing else, items not on the agenda. Anyone wish to speak, Mr. Mayor? I'm sorry, Bill. Bill I'm Bill, sorry, Bill, Mr. Dunlap. Sorry. I'm not mayor. I yet. apologize. <laughs> I was well. I was lean. I was lean back and just looked at the green light. I'm sorry. <laughs> Information only. Uh, I've talked to Don. Uh, we've talked about this 10 panel drug test. I've talked to Don. Uh, what I need to do and what he's in the process of helping me do, this will be a department handbook edition. Uh, the highway department is going to go safety sensitive with a 10 panel drug test for all safety sensitive employees. I will present that to the commission uh, next month. Thank you, sir. Mr. Brown. I think he, I've got a different issue. I think you got. Um, do we need anything else from this committee to back that up, Bill? So we're not going to take action on it now, because you know I'm pretty pretty much into that too. I, I pre appreciate that effort on your both y'all's part. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I want to go back just to last year. And we had to make some tough decisions at this level about raising some rates for insurance. Drew recommended that, uh, that we might come up short and, and we all were put in a bad position, but we made the, the, some tough decisions. As you all know, I'm a big advocate of my employees and I've had some of them come to me lately about some of the changes we made and some's paying and some's not. And I'm not picking on Troy or the school department, but at General County and the Sheriff's Office, we don't start our budget with step increases. So our employees don't get raises every year. And I don't know if it's true or not, but I would like to explore whether the school department is reimbursing their employees and nothing against the school department for their $25 a month contribution that we have to my pay and my employees pay and everybody else in General County pays. If that's the case, I'd be willing to make a motion to re rescind that motion. If, if one department's got the money to backfill it, I think we all should not pay it or we all ought to come up with the money some way to backfill the money. And I'll, again, I don't know if that's the facts or, or case, but I've been asked that question and I'm here to find out. And I know this meeting, we can't probably find out that, but uh, in the future, in the next meeting, I would like uh, some answers on that. Okay, sir. We will, we will venture into those waters. I'll get it on the agenda. 
One more comment. A county employee is a county employee. You know, uh, we're not any better than they are. They're not any better than the highway department or Phyllis Chris office uh, register of deeds. But I think we ought to be treated equal. And I, I just really have a heartburn when the general county is not getting money and we're having to fork more out to support plans uh, that obviously we need to do and, uh, and do the right thing. Then as an office holder, sit here and make a tough decision and have to look my guys in the eye and tell them we cost them 25 or $50 a piece a month then they're hearing that uh, all departments aren't paying that. With that, I'll be quiet. Thanks, sir. Anything else? Anyone wish to speak? Seeing no hands, I'll stand for motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you for being here, ladies and gentlemen.